Hello and welcome to episode number 377 of the Armin Show podcast, science, people, creativity, learning more, subscribe on YouTube if you haven't, Spotify, all the places, it's super cool and continuing to grow. On this one, we're back in person, wonderful and exciting, with our guest, very cool, YouTuber, founder, technologist, John Coogan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I am very glad to have you on, glad to have you here, there's something nice about people with people in the moment, in person. It's hard to recreate virtually in a way. Now, we have a variety of things to talk about as far as your happenings. But before we get into those, what are some things that are important to you? I wanted to start off with what's important to you in life, and then we'll go from there. It's a broad question. Um, I mean, I think family is very important. My family is probably my number one priority right now. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, more broadly, Technology is important. Entrepreneurship is important. Democracy, capitalism, these concepts are pretty important, I think. Mm -hmm. What, I wanted to go through a few of these variety of questions before we get into specific topics. What are some things you are liking about the current time, 2022, as it ends, and things that may seem off in 2022? Um, well, I think that obviously the the broader capital markets have sold off pretty significantly. Um, I think that's obviously hurts a lot of people. A lot of people lost a lot of money, but I think it's still an amazing time for innovation and technology. I mean, just look at what's going on right now with GPT and AI chats. Like there's clearly, you know, fundamental breakthroughs happening in technology that are completely disconnected from the stock market. So um, I'm very, I'm very optimistic about, um, just the progress that's happening and it seems to be completely disconnected from valuations, which is fine. Um, as long as, as long as the stuff happens, that's what's important. You mentioned valuations and GPT is super cool, by the way. I've used it. Fun, yeah. fun to use. Fun really to cool. It can generate quite a bit. Do we have an exciting landscape right now with artificial intelligence? Is it a new, fun, exciting time or are we... Will it get muddled very quickly? Every time there's a new industry, it gets muddled. Quickly. Yeah, I mean, you can already see that there's a hype cycle brewing, and there are a lot of companies that are going to raise a lot of money at inflated valuations for products that don't necessarily have long-term business plans. And it's a little bit more of just, oh, I'm going to take the hot thing and put a little twist on it and advertise it a little bit, and maybe it'll get some traction. But who knows if that's a enduring business? Um, that's a little bit inevitable. Um, you know, hopefully the, the smart people will avoid working on those projects, wasting their time with them. But at the same time, like there's nothing, you know, like it's pretty harmless to create a, you know, chat bot that helps you, you know, train your dog or something, some little niche use case that maybe it's not around in five years, but it's fun. I'm thinking a lot about the holidays. Like it's really hard to shop for folks these days because everything's digital. Like I can't, if I want to give you you know, something great. I used to be able to get you a DVD box set of a movie. Where's or, my DVD box set? <laughs> exactly. It doesn't exist anymore. If I give you a book, you'll probably say, eh, I wanted the audio book anyway. <laughs> um, true. You know, everything's kind of become digital, so it's hard to shop for people. So yeah, maybe like an AI generated portrait would be cool or, you know, a, an AI generated short story. I just, today I just wrote, I just prompted chat GPT to write a short story for my two-year-old son. I'm like, that's just fun and interesting. And it's not stealing a job. I was never going to find a creative short story writer to make that, but now it's just something, it's like a bedtime story that I can read to him. Now, somebody's going to wrap that and it's going to be a product and you're going to see ads for Instagram and maybe they make some money, you know, maybe it becomes an enduring business. I probably it's niche and that's fine, you know? Right. Yeah. That's kind of funny. He'll ask, wait, who wrote this? I can't tell you exactly, but it was a culmination of algorithm and behind the scenes. That's funny. Yeah. So that's cool. Right. I used it to create a bunch of interview questions out of nowhere. Yeah. And it was neat. You give it a you know category of person and it gives you like what to ask a fisherman or such. Sure. So that was interesting. I wonder what it'll do to education. That's the thing that keeps Just coming up. Just a great up. search engine. Yeah. Right. It's really, really good for searching. But you still have to check, fact check everything because some of the stuff that comes out of it is like wildly incorrect. This is a good point. Way better as a search engine for like programming or things where you ask it and then instead of Google leading you to some certain 
text-based things this yeah. is actually programming examples and yeah. explanations yeah yeah it's very succinct and it gives you a really thoughtful answer just sometimes it's wildly incorrect so you know you got to know your stuff to be able to tell if it's telling you the truth or not right we check it we have yeah, to check. Somebody yeah has to check. So it'll get better over time right that's cool now as far as technology this one came up with me earlier i'm in los angeles we we're in los angeles yeah. and i have before um uh, had a companion that was in Northern California in East Bay, and that area is quite cool. What would you say, which area is more packed with knowledge-seeking individuals or in, I don't want to say intelligence, but those reaching out to learn more or figure out things? Do you notice trends like that? I mean, it still seems to be heavily driven by the number of technical institutions in the area. So... In Los Angeles, Caltech is a great school. Up in, uh, you have Stanford and Berkeley in Northern California on the East Coast. You know, you have MIT, Harvard. So obviously, there's a lot of, you know, tech savvy, you know, smart, educated people coming out of there. Miami is kind of the new wild card because they don't have a extremely strong, you know, prestigious technical university, but there's a lot of effort to make Miami a tech hub. Austin, too, to some degree. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's kind of an odd question. Like the Bay Area still has a lot of advantages in terms of startups and technology. There's a lot of great programmers there. At the same time, it's never been easier to build a company outside of Silicon Valley because of the internet. So uh, we'll, we'll kind of see. It probably depends a lot on like, it's a very individual choice for a founder. Mm. If your industry just happens to have a major base in... Like if you work in the defense technology industry, you'll probably be in Southern California instead of Northern California because this is where a lot of aerospace and defense companies are. So there's an ecosystem here. Right. You are a founder. Take us through what that means to you, what it feels like to be a founder, the steps involved, and how you look at it now from, let's say, the past decade and your founding efforts. How do you see it? Hmm. Yeah, I've been a founder for a decade. I think um, entrepreneurship is great. I mean, it's, uh, it's a process of discovery, of, of, of truth seeking and like re researching and building something new. It's fun. It's very hard. Um, it's very hard to create a sustainable business that grows in perpetuity for decades, which is kind of the benchmark in Silicon Valley. It's a tough benchmark. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're looking for the most Silicon Valley venture capitalists are looking for the next Google, the next Apple, Facebook, Amazon. And there's only a few of those companies, so it's very, very difficult. Uh, at the same time, the day-to-day -day is very, very enjoyable of entrepreneurship in my experience. Um, I enjoy, it gives you a nice hybrid of being able to be an individual contributor and go and learn something new. If you need to write some code, you can just go do it yourself. There's no boss telling you what you're, role or responsibility is um, and then you can also become a manager very quickly if there's something that you don't want to do you can hire someone for that almost immediately mm -hmm. so uh, it, it kind of affords both um, the ability to kind of dive into problems but also delegate as needed it's kind of this hybrid manager individual contributor role and then at the later stage obviously it's almost entirely management tell us about your coding or did you have other people code What's your experience and ability in that category? Yeah, I love programming. I am not an incredible programmer or anything. I'm self-taught. Learned as a kid. Uh, wanted to make websites and learned a little bit of PHP. And then eventually Python, Ruby for like basic web development in college. Uh, studied economics. And Python and R are handy languages for, for uh, data analysis in economics and econometrics specifically. And then um, the basically for the last 10 years, both my companies have been focused on e-commerce. So I've done a lot of e-commerce web development, um, barely any programming in this latest company, a little bit of Python to crunch numbers and understand uh, key performance indicators. But I like programming. It's very good to understand how to do it. Um, but I've never had a full-time job as a programmer, if that makes sense. Yeah. That's cool about R. I once had an episode with the statistician who mentioned how much she likes R and has used it for a long time. Big fan of R. Yeah. That's cool. 
By the way, do you think of programming as like another language, almost like learning French? Like learning another language. Very different. I mean, I'm pretty good at learning different programming languages. I'm terrible at learning other foreign languages. I've taken Latin and I know barely any Spanish or French. It's very, very difficult for me. But programming is pretty easy to me. Um, I don't know. I mean, language seems like a good term for it, but it's obviously in a completely different category. Like the the similarities between Python and Ruby are way, way, like French and Spanish are very similar. Python and Ruby are very similar. Python and French are very different. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, right. Like the, it makes sense that they're in their own cluster called programming languages, and then spoken languages are two very different things. But I mean, fundamentally, it's a it's an attempt to communicate with the computer and and translate between binary and machine code and human readable, basically English text. What percentage of founders have some programming ability? that you have come across? It's pretty high. I mean, the majority of new startups that are wildly successful tend to have at least some technology angle. At least it's kind of a tautology because I'm sure that there's someone that's built some massive real estate empire, but we don't think of that as a startup. Right. We, we don't think of it as a, as a new unicorn. It's just some guy who made a lot of money on real estate. That's some guy. Exactly. It's kind of its own thing. Even though it is technically an enterprise, probably a C-Corp, probably a, uh, you know, a, a business like any other. So, but in Silicon Valley, certainly, I would say the vast majority of founders know at least some programming. It's getting easier and easier to learn, too. Like, it used to be much harder to learn to program because your options were, you know, these compiled C, C++ languages, Java was taught in schools. Like now you can, you know, use Python on Replit and like not need to install anything. Just installing all of the different like virtual environments and, and making sure that all the different packages are installed. Like all of that's very, very tricky and it's a big stumbling block for people. But if you can just go to a website basically and have a REPL there that you can immediately type in two plus two and hit enter and get four, like that's a really easy jumping off point to learn to code. And as those barriers have come down, I feel like the uh, the average founder has definitely become more tech literate. And then of course, there's plenty of founders that are just like world-class engineers, world-class computer scientists. Um, it's also like, it's not a binary at all. Like, like learning to code, like you can spend your whole life on it, become an AI researcher. You could be like the Jeff Dean of, of programming, or you could be like, a guy who knows how to build a website, you know, and just has spent like a couple months learning it. So what I, what I found is that there aren't many very, there aren't many founders who are really successful who have the mindset of oh, I would not be I, I I could never learn to code or I or that's beyond me. Like most people, most smart founders seem to understand that that they could learn to code in at weekend and and satisfy that that they could kind of check that box on understanding programming broadly, even though everyone understands that it takes a lifetime to become a master. That's a valid point. You can't do anything very well in a short period of time. Yeah, but you can learn you can learn a little bit about it. And that's probably, I mean, it's extremely important if your business is software. If your business isn't software, maybe you just have, maybe you're you know, a healthcare company and you have a website, but really the technical stuff is going on in a lab, well, then you probably want a biologist who's like your technical co-founder, right? Yeah. You don't necessarily need a computer scientist. You might need a chemist. And and then if you're the CEO and you don't know any chemistry, well, maybe you should learn some chemistry and like learn. We I, had a, I started a company with a, with a uh, PhD biologist and we would joke about like, what is the learn to code of biology? And we'd say like, learn to clone, which is like cloning DNA. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how familiar we are, but like right. there's like cloning assays and like I, I don't, I personally can't clone. I don't know how to do it, but, uh, but there's obviously a, you know, a series of steps that you can take to, to, you know, do the most basic biological processes and it's something that like a grad student in a lab would know how to do. So like, yeah, if you were trying to start a biotech company and you didn't know how to do that, like it would be very difficult to manage PhDs, I'm sure. Um, yeah, that's true. I once had a guest on who's a chemist in Glasgow, and he uh, does computation, but he would not be able to do what he does if he didn't have his amazing 
uh, chemistry understanding and then have people underneath him who know also programming and other things like that. Yeah, and he probably knows a little bit about both at least. Right. Right. He wants to create the field of computation, as he calls it, computation with chemistry. Sure. That's pretty cool. Now, you and your founding, maybe what you have mentioned is previously you have uh, two main items that come to mind. One of them, which I believe my friend has used, but Soylent mm. is well known and has a cool name that's easily memorable. What did you what did you find most difficult about building Soylent and um where has it gone across this timetable? Yeah. I think the earliest challenge, I mean, we were just new to business in general. So every challenge you face is the first time you've seen that challenge. So that's a great quote. Yeah. I mean, that's just the nature of being 22 and starting a company and watching it grow. There's a lot of, there's a lot of new problems and you got to figure out, you know, each one kind of from first principles or talk to folks and kind of compile a network of, of resources that can inform your decision. Very rarely are you just looking back to the last time you solved that problem personally. So that was probably like the big meta problem think like the more there's a there's a few like more tactical problems just like understanding the price elasticity of the product and like getting the pricing right or moving correctly on R&D to launch the 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 right next generation products at the right time um like not moving so fast that you overwhelm the company with with dozens and dozens of new products, but at the same time, not taking so long that you fall behind on what is the product that the customer needs at a particular moment in time. It's usually like a balancing act with all of those things. The path through Soylent, how would you describe that? Uh, how many years in total? Yeah, I was there for five years. It's been 10 years now. And um, yeah, I mean, when it started, it was just two or three people living in a one-bedroom apartment in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. Everyone was kind of going broke, couldn't afford food. Making our own food was a kind of a logical next step. So, so it was a meal replacement shake designed to be as healthy, convenient, and affordable as possible. So product was in very early development stage, but uh, my co-founder wrote about it online. It got a lot of traction. A lot of people were interested in it, signed up to buy it and and wanted to kind of learn more, participate, become a member of the community, purchase it, become a customer. And so uh, the company just kind of grew from there and it became a very kind of viral sensation. Like the blog post led to main, the mainstream media uh, a lot of a lot of media attention, Vice Magazine, Discovery News, BBC, like uh, all, all these different uh, media organizations wanted to tell the story, and that helped kind of catapult the the product into like relevancy, and obviously grew the business a ton. So we were we were selling a lot of this stuff very very quickly, and then since then uh, the, the product's been good. Obviously, it's not as like viral or or trendy, um, but uh, company still sells a lot of that product, and there's a lot of people that still use the product regularly, which is great. That's true. I have somebody who's one of their favorite things for a while that they mentioned them. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone knows someone. <laughs> like it's, it was very popular. Now, you have a new item as well Yeah, with nicotine, getting nicotine to individuals. What was the problem you solved and how is that one going? Yeah, very, very simple. I mean, my co-founder was trying to quit smoking, didn't like any of the alternatives, wanted to think of a new way to enjoy nicotine that would be less focused on the medicinal angle and more focused on kind of the lifestyle component. Like just the way we, the way we're thinking about it was like Tesla on its face is a car company dedicated to saving the environment and reducing carbon emissions. But that's not actually why people buy Teslas. It's always some other reasons. People buy Teslas because they're cool. They're fast. They have good technology inside like it's just a good car and that's why people buy them. And then they can go and say, yeah, I'm doing it because I'm saving the environment. That's why I spent $50,000 instead of $30,000. Look what I've but done. really they want a car that goes zero to 60 in like three seconds or whatever. Um, and so we we thought the same thing was would be true in the, in the nicotine industry, essentially, that we wanted to create a product where 
people would think of it as like kind of a you know a more mature choice but the real reason that they were picking it was just because it was the best product on the market so we focused a lot on the formulation the flavor the texture the strength the branding the packaging the delivery experience the price point everything was thought for, through from like first principles on what would create a good consumer experience and so i mean it's been amazing we've helped like 10,000 people quit smoking we've helped a lot of people get off nicotine entirely like the 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 impact has been really really good um but we didn't when we started the company in 2016 there was a little bit of like an overblown meme in silicon valley about like well we're saving the world we're saving people's lives and like yeah, we kind of knew that the media would turn on that. And it was also obvious that a lot of those projects were very hokey and they often didn't turn out well at all. <laughs> um, but uh, this one's interesting because we really we really do get emails from people who are like, thank you. Like I picked up smoking while I was doing X, Y, or Z. And this was the only thing that worked for me. So it's that's very, um, it's very encouraging. Now, from a regulatory perspective, it's extremely complex. We we can't make direct quick claims about most of our products. We do have a nicotine lozenge that is approved by the FDA for smoking cessation, which means that we can definitively say that that product helps you quit smoking. With our other products, we're not there yet. Hopefully we'll get there one day, but um, at this point, all we can say is, hey, it's you know it has this much nicotine in it, this is the flavor, this is the strength, this is how you buy it, and and we just have to market it just as that great product so it's almost like if we're if we were selling a tesla and we could only talk about the the speed and we couldn't talk about the environmental impact at all that's kind of how we operate makes sense that reminds me of some companies like they can't mention their weight loss effects yeah exactly and nicotine is one of those things where i i mean i've never i've never seen any really solid studies on this but some people claim that like it can be used for weight loss or like appetite suppression but i mean i would i would never recommend using it for that um uh, but yeah, it's one of those things where like every once in a while a company comes along and they like, you know, advertise that benefit and then they get slapped on the hand by the FDA. And so a lot of, a lot of our, <laughs> a lot of our strategy is just like ideally being like the good actor in the space who doesn't get their hand slapped by the FDA because we actually listen to their rules and kind of can kind of see the spirit of what they want. Even if they're, even if the, the rule or the law is, is vague, we can kind of figure out, okay, what are they really going for here? They're probably... They probably want people not to inhale, you know, harmful products. So we don't, we don't sell any inhaled products. Right? It's pretty simple. Or we, they don't want people to use the tobacco leaf because the tobacco leaf has carcinogens in it and that's unhealthy. So we don't use the tobacco leaf whatsoever. Mm. As far as their communications with you to limit you in some way, do they directly say... This was an issue, this was that, or is it that you oh, wouldn't want to hear from no, them in the first no. place? No, the FDA just puts out all sorts of rules and, and then um, and then it's it's incumbent upon the you know, the industry to follow those rules. Sometimes there's direct communication, but but very rarely. Most of the time it's the um, the FDA just has a set of rules on their website and you need to adhere to them. Um, but there are a lot of companies that don't. <laughs> and there are a lot of companies that just say, well, let's see how long we can get along, we, 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 how, we, how long we can get by. So there's a lot of manufacturers abroad who just make the cheapest possible product. They don't care about safety whatsoever. They import it almost illegally. They sell it at like, you know, re retail shops that don't check anything and they've created a real problem. So they get a lot of negative attention, mm. probably more so in the future. Right. Uh, fast money comes with slow problems is one quote that one person yeah. says. Yeah, 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 that's right. It's just, you're not, it's not how the world is supposed to be. Yeah. One thing that comes to mind is you mentioned the, like the people that buy something and it's not for the reason that they might say they bought it for, but to showcase something else might be like a hidden motive underneath. Sure, sure. How does a business creator find those hidden motives? Is it asking customers or is it thinking ahead or outside of what they're doing? How do you find those out? Ooh, I don't know. That's hard to do kind of like a first principle search on. I don't know. I mean, there's probably some sort of framework that you could layer over like any any business, any any idea, kind of look at the motivations of the customers that use it. I was thinking about like, like LinkedIn, like why do people post on LinkedIn? Like they're creating content for free for the LinkedIn network to like run ads next to. 
and they're usually not directly compensated. Like on YouTube, they, they, they send you a check for the ads that they run on your channel. So, so a lot of people are on YouTube just because they are being paid to be on YouTube, essentially. Um, there's some people that do other stuff, but in general, that's why a lot of people post on YouTube. On LinkedIn, it's not really the case. So people are there for professional advancement, most likely. They're there to network. So they come and they post content with the hopes of making connections and advancing their career. And like same thing on Instagram, but Instagram is like a little bit more complicated because some people will post like a vacation photo or them on like a private jet and they, and like the, the kind of professed intention might be to like connect with their friends or like share their life experience. But like the like kind of revealed <laughs> revealed preference is maybe like to flex or like to seem cool um, or to gain social status or maybe to set yourself up for a brand deal that could monetize later. So there's like kind of a, there's a suite of, of, of intentions and motivations that bring users to do things, including just buy a product, like buy a nicotine gum. There's a variety of reasons why someone would do that. There's a variety of reasons why someone would buy um, a Tesla. Some of it has to do with just supporting Elon Musk. You know, it just kind of depends. The brand, it, it, all of this is like, yeah, it's very vague. What about your personality causes you to be a YouTuber? And what are some things you hope to express through your videos, which are value packed? And I want to talk about value as well after this. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I'm somewhere in between an introvert and an extrovert. I... I do like having conversations with people about technology and and just maintaining a broad social network, I guess would be the phrase. Um, but I also like sitting at home and researching and reading. So I can kind of do both. During the pandemic, there wasn't really option to connect with other people in technology since there weren't any happy hours happening or networking events or really anything happening. So I had free time for the first time in a decade, I was bored. And I figured that if I started kind of making more noise online, I'd meet more people. And that was, and so I, I started posting videos, mostly because it seemed like a unique opportunity, like a like a little bit of a white space in tech. Like there were, there were a lot of people with, um, there were a lot of people that were on Twitter and there were some people that had um, newsletters and some people that had podcasts, but no one had really done video essays before. Um, Gary Tan had done a, a vlog, which was very cool. So it was stories from his life, his trips, and and he would do some video essays, but they were a little bit more tailored towards like his experience personally, which was amazing experience. It was a really successful venture capitalist, right? Um, and, and he's been a founder, a designer, like there's just, he has tons to share. Um, so I, I wanted to separate from that and not be like a Gary Tan copycat that would not fly. Um, and so it just tickled a lot of different, it like scratched a lot of different itch, itches in the sense that I like video editing. I like cameras. I like 3d rendering and cinema 4d and after effects and motion graphics and all those different things. And it was kind of, a the, the videos were a way to kind of bring all of that together. Um, so it was just a lot of different skills that I'd never really produced a full product around. I'd just been tinkering with for a long time. This is like a way to bring it, bring everything together. And it also helps with public speaking. I think it's a big part of the reason why I, I really like going on podcasts is because I feel like it's just a skill that you need to build over a very long time. I'm sure that you've gotten way better at interviewing over four years, right? Yes. And, uh, yeah. So just like a lot of curiosity, a lot of just desire to like put a bunch of things together and no real clear business plan. I wasn't thinking like, oh, this will be a job in the future. It was more just like, this will be fun and it probably won't go poorly. <laughs> It'll probably wind up being valuable in the future. I like that you mentioned that you have a lot of the pieces that were there and you put them together in something that fit that. Yeah. That's a smart move. Taking what you already have because that's your foundation and then Okay, I can branch yeah, it's off. It's really this. important to find like your unique, your your unique value prop. Um, and for me, that's like, I have an economics degree. I'm a programmer. I'm a founder. Like, there aren't too many people 
and I also like cinematography and film and I can talk on camera. So there's a lot of different things that come together to kind of create a unique, a unique experience that isn't directly copyable. If you're like, I, a lot of times I'll tell like a pretty, a pretty straightforward story about a company that really anyone could tell if they just did the research. But uh, when I'm at my best, it's like when I'm injecting like my unique perspective that only I have. And that's something I'm trying to work on more. It's a little bit tricky, but, but, um, but that is something that's like, that creates like defensibility. This is very true. When I was watching your material, I thought to myself, I would not, it would be such a stretch for me to do the same because of my different way of presentation. Sure. So that sets you into a space of your own. And the more you do it, the more it's your own. So that's a nice feature. I like that concept too that you're bringing up. It becomes your own. And you already were in a space that you're like, okay, this is me in general. But then you do it more. Yeah. Now it's like a pillar of you. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people start by just copying something directly. That rarely works. Mixing like two to three things together usually works a little bit better. And then eventually they start sprinkling on things that like only they can bring to the table. Um, I didn't really, I'm trying to think about the early, early videos. I didn't really have too many like templates to like copy. Um, but I did try a lot of different things. Like I tried unscripted where I would just put up some slides and just talk freely about the notes that I had. Then I started scripting things out and, and doing lots of like charts and graphs and I don't know if I was looking at looking to anyone in particular, but it was kind of like a, it was kind of like just a, I mean, that was probably the first version of like mixing two things together. Cause it was like the type of talk that you would see at like YC at like Y Combinator, or at like, or like a typical like venture capitalist might give about like how to raise money from venture capitalists, it was like very well-trodden topic. And they might have a slide up that shows, you know, a bar graph of amount of money raised over time or something like that. And my unique little extra input would be at making that graph animated just because I liked After Effects and I enjoyed animation. Um, so that was the first, that was the first like added an extra layer. But then I started adding in like storytelling and, and, and interview segments and like all sorts of different things that kind of mixed up and created just the kind of a, a pretty unique product. There's still things that I'm pretty close to other channels that do, that do similar things. And you can kind of still say like, Oh, if you add this person and this person, you kind of get John. Um, but you know, the hope is that that kind of, you know, becomes less and less over time. Let's say you just had a video of, uh, let's say three people talking. And it was just a recorded video with your abilities. What's the first thing you would do to take that from just a video to more interesting with any sort of effect or editing? Oh, I mean, yeah, the, the, the editing effects like that, that, that doesn't really, it's kind of like the question of like, can you fix it in the edit? Like, I don't think there's that much that you can do. Like you're much better off like focusing on the story and like coaching those people into telling a compelling story with like a beginning, a middle and an end, like a three act structure, just, just, just reading up on story like like a good storyteller can just sit there on their iphone and tell a great story and like get a bajillion views because it's compelling if there's no compelling narrative it doesn't matter how flashy the effects are <laughs> that doesn't matter um and the best and the best editing the best lighting the best audio mix is all in service of that story so this is something that you know you can spend years on. I'm just scratching the surface of this stuff, but in theory, it's like if I'm telling a story about something that's a little bit more mysterious, it's a you know, we're telling a mystery. How did this thing happen? How did we get here? Well, like you could imagine like mysterious lighting. You could imagine mysterious music in the background. You could imagine instead of like super fast cuts that are really high energy, it could be like slow fades and dissolves to like show the passage of time. Or then it could speed up when you're, when, when like the bad guys are closing in and things are getting more uh, dramatic. Then, then the, the tempo of the music and the tempo of the editing and the cutting and, and all of the different effects could be in service of that story. But if you don't have you don't have a good story it's not really that much you can do i mean there's tons of people on youtube that just like they just use the retention hacks and they, they just edit for retention and they edit just to like kind of like trick someone into watching basically 
um not a durable path so not something i'm particularly interested in i like that the way you described how the story could be let's say compelling was compelling in itself which means <laughs> you have that in you already yeah it just takes practice it's like a producer describing yeah. so it's already there that's yeah. cool it's nice to have that quality and then you're like adding to the emotional components of the person behind as they're watching oh it just feels like this oh the light yeah I'm into yeah this. ideally ideally everything works together it's, it's really really hard especially when you have multiple people involved in the project because the the writer needs to communicate that to the editor um it's it's a little bit easier if if um and, and I, I think that's why you see so many people on youtube that are completely solo and they become absolutely massive because they have complete creative control so at every moment they're like well yeah of course i'm going to use mysterious music during the mysterious segment because i wrote it and i know it's mysterious whereas a lot of times people will have a writer who maybe wrote that this part was mysterious but then the editor didn't get the the memo and so that can create a lot of confusion. So having like an integrated team, if you have multiple people, and most of these bigger projects have multiple people, um, that that becomes like a real challenge. And, and that's the role of like a director, right? Is to like bring everything together. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Made me think of speed here. How relevant to you is speed of getting the idea started going next step, next step? Yeah. Because it is a one person I operation. I mean, it, it's it's a hack in many ways, uh, information density, um, the YouTube algorithm rewards retention and the amount of time that somebody spends watching is directly proportional to the amount of impressions it'll give. Mm -hmm. So speed of production. Oh, speed of production. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it changes. So, uh, at the beginning, if you're doing anything, learning to program chemistry, anything like just, putting in the time is the most important thing going to the gym like the person who just goes to the gym regularly a couple days a week for five years is going to look way better than the person that spends a year thinking of the most optimal plan goes for like five days and then like never does it again right um like the the, the discipline of of uh and, and there's a bunch of examples of this the the famous one is like they they had two groups of of students they said go into these rooms and you have to make, you have to sit on a pottery wheel and create a vase. Um, group A, your goal is just to make as many vases as possible. Group B, you have to make one amazing vase. And of course, group A, the quantity one, created a much better vase because they just got the practice in. So at the early stage, speed of production is very, very important. That's why you see so many people, Casey Neistat, um, who, who else has done that? Like David Dobrik, they all did like daily vlogs. Logan Paul, they all, they, all, they all would put out a video every single day. And now Logan Paul puts out a video like once a month, but it's like really, really strong storytelling really because he's, he's gotten in the reps. Like regardless of what you think about him, like he is an incredible storyteller and, and very, very strong at creating compelling content because he just has made a thousand videos, right? Um, and yeah, there's a lot of people that are like that where they've just put in the work. And so, um, yeah, staying on weekly was really important for me at the early stage. Now I have a little bit of a, a little bit of an eye so I can, I can put a little bit more time into things. I know a guy who puts out like one video a year and does fine. Like th there are some people who just know that if they just put more and more time into one thing, they'll, they'll, they'll do really well. For me, I'm still in the mode of, of like not quite sure that I can always detect what will do well. So I'm still in the learning phase, half the, I'm like half in the learning phase. So um, I try and keep the production moving pretty quickly. Mm. But yeah. That's kind of cool. Well, once a year, that's very uncommon. Extremely. Right. But if it can work, it can work. Value in your videos. What is value to the end user? Or how do you see that part? How do you know you're bringing them the thing they're looking for? Is it as simple as like if somebody wanted to see the soccer highlights, you show them the soccer highlights? Or is it more like you are doing a lot of work so that your 10 hours of time is put into this three minutes of time for them? Yeah, I think it's like it's infotainment. Fundamentally, that's the genre. So informational entertainment needs to be entertaining. There needs to be a story. Maybe, I mean, I'm probably pretty light on the entertainment side, um, but the videos should be enjoyable to watch. They're not like laugh a minute. There's not tons of jokes or anything. They're fairly serious, but they do move 
quickly and I try and deliver a lot of information. It's basically like everything I've been thinking about for the entire week in just summary form. Um, and then just boil down so that it's just as condensed as possible and just no, no waste. I just trim out everything that's wasteful, basically. Just try and be as succinct as possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's difficult. Like you're not, ever, you're not always going to be able to, you know, blow someone's mind with like an entirely new insight. Like almost everything, there's at least a gr small group of people that know. But a lot of times it's like, I, I had a video on the metaverse that got 8 million views. And, and from my, from my perspective, all of my friends were like completely unimpressed by those ideas because we'd all been talking about them for months, right? But to the 8 million people that watched that, it was new. And so figuring out, you know, what is the, what is the information that like the next group, because like, you know, there's like this adoption curve for technology where you have, you know, the, the, the founder, the creator, the early adopter, the early majority, the late majority, there's kind of, you know, over time there, are, I mean, there are people that, you know, are just starting to use smartphones now, right? Because they're like, oh, I like my landline. Those are like the latest adopters. It's very rare now. But, you know, I also know people that were using smartphones and, you know, over a decade ago, right? Uh, more, uh, maybe like tw almost 20 years ago. Um, and so, so figuring out, you know, what, what are the ideas in, in my inner circle that are going to propagate beyond to the, the, you know, the early majority, the late majority? And, and how can I, how can I, kind of educate them in an entertaining way mm -hmm. yeah it doesn't have to be always entertaining if that's not your thing it can be informative yeah it's the thing that speaks to you the most yeah it's not it's not it's not supposed to be a wikipedia article it is supposed to be a story but there's supposed to be a lot of information in there. It's supposed to, I'm supposed, you're supposed to walk away with like, oh yeah, I definitely took away like one or two new facts or, or like opinions that I hadn't heard before. That's, that's the value. By putting out messages on well-known topics and on people that are popular, do you get sometimes, have you got, have you run into any difficulties, pushback from people like, oh, this video said this, we were not a fan. Anything not like really. Not I mean, really. the comment section is always such a mess. Like every, every video you upload, you get, you know, a million bot comments and then you get a lot of weird comments. Um, sometimes they'll just be like factual inaccuracies. Like, oh, I misspoke there or, you know, misquoted some data or something. A lot of times you'll get, you'll get just comments from people who think they have, they like, they think they have a correction to offer, but actually it's either addressed in the video later or they're wrong and <laughs> that happens a lot. Um, so yeah, nothing crazy. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I'm sure at some point there will be, uh, I mean, that's part of like YouTube's a little less combative than Twitter because Twitter, if you, if you tweet something, I can just quote tweet it and be like, look at this idiot. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone should like go and attack this guy. And it's like very, very hostile. I like Twitter. I, I, I enjoy it a lot. It, but you, it's a completely different frame of mind. Like you can, you can attack someone in two seconds. You can just quote tweet it. This person sucks, and boom! Like you've just thrown your army at their army, and you'll see who, be, you, you know, you, you see who says the meaner things. Basically, uh, on YouTube, if I put out a twenty-minute or twenty-five-minute video about a topic, and I get like a couple things wrong, like you can leave a comment, but no one's going to read that. So. First off, you need to create a new video to comment, basically, because that's the that's the native currency of the platform is videos. So, you need a creator who will who will take the time to make a video about my video, saying that I'm wrong. It could take like days. <laughs> yeah, takes, I was wrong. Yeah, and that does happen. Like, uh, I mean, like Coffeezilla is always calling out different YouTube channels for promoting crypto scams. And he does a very, very good job of kind of like acting as like the the police chief of YouTube. And he goes around and makes sure that everyone is behaving ethically. And if you, if you break the rules, even if, even if the SEC isn't coming after you, if you just, if you're, if you're playing it too fast and loose, like CoffeeZilla will come after you, which is, I, I think a benefit to the, to the ecosystem. Um, and then like, th there's the same thing for the historians. Like uh, I think Johnny Harris had a video about, uh, about Europe and, and Europe's expansion, maybe in the 1600s, 1700s, something like that. Um, and there was a historian who said, oh, he simplified a bunch of things. He got a lot of things wrong. So he put, he actually made a video 
full of corrections to that video. And that was a really great thing because everyone watched that video. They realized that there were some things that Johnny had simplified, but then uh, Johnny Harris actually reached out to the guy and they collaborated on the next video to make sure it was factually accurate because this guy was a real, real historian. And Johnny Harris, he's a Vox reporter. He's, you know, a little bit more of a storyteller. So there's always this balance of like the facts have to be correct and then you can like weave the narrative. And sometimes if you let the narrative get, take, take the front seat, um, it can be more enjoyable. It can be more on the entertainment side, but then it's less on the info side. And so you need this like base layer of like ironclad facts, and then you can put a story on top of it. Sometimes the story is not there. Sometimes the facts are are so confusing or so complicated that the, that the story won't really care, won't really like carry. Um, but people want to hear a hero's journey. They want to hear a person who who was living an ordinary life went out for adventure had a bunch of you know fails failures and uh, and and fought back and eventually was victorious right they want a clear villain sometimes that's not the case sometimes the world's more a little bit more messy and so there's a desire to simplify these stories um, but if that if the facts get in the way of that like you might you might get someone making a response video but fortunately like I'm not big enough to really attract that attention and I try and lean like I, I'm still leaning like very, very much on like the factually oriented side. And I think if there's a critique of my content right now, it's probably that it's, it's, there's not enough of a story. There's, there's, there's just, it's just fact, 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 fact. <laughs> Cause that's kind of the way I think. Um, but it'll get there. I like that. I noticed the detail oriented nature of your content and that if there is some little thing you will put in the description and correct it. Yeah. Pretty easy to do. Pin a comment that, that that stems all the bleeding. If if someone's upset about you mispronouncing something, it's, if you take care of it, then usually the individual that even corrects their own items, I think they'll never have an issue because the people that have an issue go off into maybe incorrect territory way far off until people are like, hey, hey, hey. But you're almost already correcting yourself. Yeah, I mean the bar is also so low. Like on YouTube, like like the bad actors are like actively promoting like get rich quick schemes every single day. <laughs> so like if like if if you know if some infotainment YouTuber like misquotes a date or something or like gets the if I say million instead of billion or something, is it the end of the world? Like no. <laughs> right. <laughs> As opposed to someone who's like actively trying to get you to put all your money into something that they're just going to steal. Like <laughs> they're, they're much bigger fish to fry on YouTube. That's true. Yeah. Some things don't go uh, corrected. They're just left alone. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's or people just kind of now or, or they, 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 there's people understand. One thing that you reminded me of is that the individuals that support you are your supporters, but then the individuals that challenge you maybe in detail I would say are still closer to you than the general public because they're in your space and you can collaborate later. Yeah, yeah, at least they're aware. Right. I want to try this thing where I would throw out a few topics of interest of technology at this time sure. and have your thoughts on each one. So because they're in some of your content or in the general discussion. So either uh, companies or concepts or names. But uh, currently the one we mentioned earlier, but artificial intelligence thoughts. Yeah. I mean, huge topic, decades of work going into, you know, an overnight success, very important technology, very good, very interesting, hard to, hard to exactly predict who will be the biggest winner. There are a variety of folks that could wind up becoming the, the victors could wind up being the data centers that make the most money. These algorithms are expensive to run. Could be the research labs that make the fundamental models. Could be the product companies that build products on top of the models. Could be just the people that wind up using the models. Um, it's, it's a little unclear, it's a little early to say. I think OpenAI has done some really, really incredible things and they seem to be maintaining their lead even though they only had like a monopoly on image generation for a few months before mid journey and stable diffusion came out they they now have a new monopoly on chat gpt we'll see how long that hap how that how long that maintains until there's an open source or competitor that's as good or nearly as good mid journey and and stable diffusion, I feel like are 
are close enough to Dolly to take market share from Dolly in the sense of how do you monetize that? I don't know that there will be a uh, that there will be a, a like a, a durable business and image generation for OpenAI to maintain for a very long time. Um, but it's still really really important research and it's very very cool. Uh, in general, AI's it's amazing because you don't have to go looking very far for use cases, which was the big problem with the crypto uh, wave. So that people were always saying, well, you know, how, like tangibly, how does this work? How, how is this better? If, I, if you say, um, we're going to create a crypto podcasting network, how, how does that benefit you as a podcaster? You probably want more listeners. You want your listeners to have a good user experience, be able to listen to their podcasts while they're on flights you want to be able to engage with your community you might need you might want to monetize with them and have them pay for premium podcasts or something like that um it was always unclear if the crypto stuff was necessary there or if it was just a kind of an add-on whereas with ai it like the the use cases are so apparent like ai ai driven podcasting network oh so you mean that there will be instant transcripts in every single language perfectly oh you mean that if i need to listen in in french instead of english it'll just automatically translate it and it will sound like john is speaking french great like that's a very simple use case i just thought of it in two seconds and it's obviously beneficial and very doable like this is not 20 years away this is a few years away it will drive real value people will actually get value out of that and there's just no question now the big question is like who gets rich off of that who makes the most money is it going to be you the podcaster who makes money from french listeners you you probably get a piece of it what about you know the 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 ai research lab that trained that model will they be able to hold on to the intellectual property and the rights and, the, and will they be able to put that translation api behind it or that translation model behind an api and charge for it so that every time you upload you have to pay 10 cents to translate it into french if that's the case, then yes, you, they will make a lot of money. But if it becomes an open source implementation and it's just and it's just you know out there and it's just so so commoditized that there's nothing you know special, maybe they don't make as much money from that particular use case. But I think overall there will be some some you know really really valuable use cases. It's just a matter of finding moats that can be built around the AI. The AI itself is probably not a moat. Certainly not if you're just like a startup that's going to, you know, build an app around chat GPT. Like that's probably not a moat because anyone could do that. It's an open API. All you need to do is just set it up and you're good. Um, but uh, there will be some people who build really, really cool companies. And even if, even if the companies, even if we don't get a wave of like, you know, this doesn't have to disrupt Google and Amazon and Facebook and Apple to be hugely impactful. Like there's just so much that this can do and be fun and be cool. I, I would I would caution against people uh, who who you know say this is like this is a panacea. The this is the you know the 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 singularity is here. All of that. Like we're not quite there yet, but there's a lot of really cool technology happening. So it's just fun to follow along. Ray Kurzweil said the singularity is near. So. We're definitely close, like on the grand scheme of things. I mean, humanity's been around for what hundreds of thousands of years, and you know, we're definitely more than halfway there. <laughs> like, like if you think about what's possible in the next, you know, thousands of years, like we're, we, it feels like we're closer than, than, uh, um, than you know, we, we, than we ever have been. But uh, who knows? Could be another twenty years or something. I like to describe. There's the different layers. And we can't always see which one is going to be the most profitable one beforehand. Yeah. yeah, so people place their bets and we see. Right. Have you seen that, by the way, on you can option markets or bet markets where you can bet on basically anything? Yeah, yeah. prediction markets. Yeah, oh, yeah. prediction markets, yeah. It's cool. Robin Hansen uh, helped work on that and I talked with him once. Yeah, we have heard of him. He's a cool guy. He wrote The Elephant in the Brain with Kevin Simler. I have two last questions for you. Sure. One is through your content generation, what are the things you most want to uh, express? And then what is, uh, who are the individuals that it has allowed you to connect with that you would not have expected? Yeah, easy. 
Uh, the number one kind of philosophy that I want to promote is one of techno optimism. I think that technology is an incredible force for good. I think that it needs to be um, just understood and studied and promoted. And I think that more people need to understand how technology works and um, go and build technology that can solve problems. That's fundamentally what technology does is it solves problems. So um, no matter what the problem is, I think that there's usually a technology that can address that. Um, and I include like biotechnology in there. So even curing cancer is a technology problem. And um, and there's usually, you know, people, people, you know, have a lot of frustration with TikTok for various reasons. There is a technology. There is a technological solution to TikTok, like to create a better platform that's more educational. To uh, you know, th th there are ways to solve that problem. Of course, um, you know, it'll probably be solved politically <laughs> before <laughs> before someone does that. But there certainly is a is a technological solution to most of these problems. So um, that that is definitely something that I want to promote. And um, there's a lot of negative content on YouTube. There's a lot of people that are are putting out kind of depressing content about how everything is bad, every company is evil, everything is evil. Um, and they don't even have a consistent philosophy because in this, in one breath, they'll tell you like, uh, you know, Saddam Hussein was the most evil person ever. And then they'll say, America was the most evil for going and killing Saddam. It's like, okay, like you have no philosophy. You're just a nihilist. And I find that very boring. Um, so promoting a like a clear philosophy of techno optimism is really important. And then in terms of the type of person that I'm trying to connect with, it's it's almost always you know early founders, the future founders. I I think there's a lot of there's a lot of active founders, uh, millennials who listen to podcasts and are on uh, Substacks and on Twitter. But I think the next generation of founders are probably watching YouTube right now, maybe on TikTok too. Um, certainly in Minecraft and Roblox and and coding and and tinkering. Um, but uh, YouTube is a unique way to reach them at a younger age before they start companies. And so um, that's always been the most impressive people that I talk to are just the very, very young entrepreneurs who are already building things in high school. And I usually have to be the one to tell them like, hey, maybe, like, uh, this is really cool, but you should finish high school. And then you can think about <laughs> doing this full time. Maybe maybe you don't have to go to college, but uh, I don't know about dropping out of high school. Who knows? M maybe, maybe that'll work out for some people. Um, but uh, school is a unique time to, to get to just go and explore things with very low risk. Whereas if you're building a company, there is some significant risk to that. Um, but yeah, just meeting young entrepreneurs and, and hopefully just giving them some historical context. I'm not even giving them like specific advice. I'm just trying to give them examples that they can pull from and then kind of connect to their own, to their own framework for thinking about things. It's very hard to to say there's only one way to do this thing or there's only one one uh, one pattern that they should follow. But if they are able to just see a lot of examples of successful companies, they'll be able to kind of pattern match and create their own their own path. So yeah, that's the goal. That's cool. John, where can people find your material on the internet or where would you direct them to? Yeah, YouTube's the main platform that I focus on. You can just search my name, John Coogan, and I'm also on Twitter. So you can follow me and chat with me there. Wonderful. Very glad to have had you on. Thanks for joining us and discussing these various topics, your founded companies and your YouTubing and some of your other thoughts as well. Yeah. Thanks a lot. This was a lot of fun. Very cool. Talk to you soon. And we are out.